and I was like, okay, I, I should be fine. Like, I'm probably going to get at least one of these companies. I think I was talking to maybe like four or five different companies and they all, every single one of them went on hiring freezes. Hi everyone. This is Jay from interviewquery.com. And today I'm here with Alex. Alex is a data scientist and machine learning engineer at Rakuten. Uh, Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. It's like super exciting to be here. Yeah, and I am also super excited to talk to you. Um, as I mentioned before this interview, uh, I was really excited when you got the job. Uh, I remember talking to you over chat uh, for like a couple months uh, before this, uh, where you were, we were discussing kind of like the uh, events of like, you know, COVID-19 and how that had impacted interviewing. And I know that you had started uh, your job search kind of like during that time. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess to begin with, I'd love to kind of get a sense and tell like the audience of what your background is and how you kind of got started in data science. Yeah, sure. So I'll just start with the disclaimer that I'm still sort of early in my career. Um, so I haven't had that much interview experience as well as like, I don't have that many stories to tell, but um, maybe this is still going to be helpful for those that are also early in their career uh, to show that they can still get a job in data science or machine learning. Um, but yeah, so I graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science about three years ago. And uh, while I was an undergrad, I had uh, basically internships every summer. Um, so I'd say that's probably one of the best decisions I've made. And it's not like it was my choice to work an intern, like you ha definitely have to work for it. Um, yeah. So there's a little bit of luck involved. Um, it's not like they just have a whole bunch of internships lying around and I'm like, yeah, I guess I'll do one. Yeah. Um, but um but yeah, so like my first summer, I interned at an aerospace company, um, writing some software, which is pretty cool. And then the second summer, I worked for the California Public Utilities Commission, which was like a state funded program for like internet connectivity tools. Right. And then my third summer, uh, I worked at the genomics lab at UC Santa Cruz. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's like a wide array of experiences. So like, um, by the time I was a senior, when I like compared notes with other seniors, it was like, oh, I actually have quite a bit of experience. Um, and um, a company took notice, which was the company that came to my school to interview students. Um, so I was super fortunate about that. And then uh, it was like an email, uh, email data startup. Um, so I interviewed with them and I got the offer. And so yeah, I worked with them for about two and a half years. And so that was my official role as like, well, it's like a, a data science role, but not necessarily data scientist. Okay. And then, um, what do so you I mean left to, actually, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. No, yeah, that's a good, great question. Cause usually you don't get hired as a data scientist, um, right out of undergraduate program. Yeah. Um, that, that role usually comes with either some more years of experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be data science experience. It could be like so many different fields, right. But just like something that's more analytical, maybe mathematical, those types of roles or you have a master's or like a PhD. Um, those are usually the roles that you can become a data scientist with immediately. Um, but um, yeah, so I started off as a data science intern. Um, that was the role on paper. And then I got promoted to associate data scientist. And then after two years is when I got the official data scientist role. Gotcha, okay. And so uh, I guess starting out there, like did you feel like the, um like the progression that you made made you officially more of a data scientist or were you just kind of like doing the same thing except you just had more experience now basically? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So it's more of the latter. So I don't feel like my roles changed that much in terms of the work that I was doing. Um, I would say that like the machine learning project started to come towards the end of my time there. So I guess that's the only thing that, that changed. Whereas um, in the beginning, I was definitely doing more analytical stuff um, but really, I think the, the point of data science and what data science should be is just about um, how much of an impact you're able to make. And yeah. um, so a lot of people equate data science with machine learning, which I think is totally flawed. Um, no one cares about the models that you build if, they're, if they don't actually have a business impact. Yeah. And so my objective always from day one to, to when I actually left was always like, okay, how can I use data to actually make an impact to bring more revenue to the company? And I think that's... Um, that's part of the reason why I was able to, to do so well in the company and no, no task was like, uh, below me, that kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, I would say that like, since I got more familiar with the business, 
uh, I was able to maybe like, I wouldn't say like I was a manager or anything like that, but I was able to have more responsibility. I was put in charge of more projects. I even like worked with a lot of other people, uh, maybe like a mentor capacity, not like a managerial capacity, but yeah. um, so my responsibilities changed, but not so much the type of work I was doing. Gotcha. Cool. No, that's great. Uh, and I think I really relate to that too, because uh, when I first started at uh, Jobber as like an associate data scientist, I think that was my title. Um, I started working on like random projects. I like started doing this like classifier or like um, just like model to like predict like salaries for different jobs on our platform. And then I think no one really even told me like, hey, like you probably shouldn't be doing this. It's kind of like a waste of your time because we're not going to actually implement it anywhere. Uh, but it just took some time for me to like realize that um, if, you know, if they, it wasn't like prioritized or if it wasn't like actually meaningful to the business, then um, you probably just shouldn't be working on it. Right. And I think it mm -hmm. also takes a little bit of time to just like understand what is actually meaningful. Uh, but getting that leg up initially is like a huge advantage. And I'm not entirely even sure how uh, you would do that now. Like just understand that coming from like a, kind of a new grad point of view, just because uh, I think as an intern, you also get, you don't get exposed to that too much. Um, or you're like an intern at like a really big company and they just, you know, have these like projects for you to do and, you know, they help someone, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's not like directly correlated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the only difference between an intern and someone that's not an intern really is that as an intern, it's way more about like them giving projects to you. Um, but like naturally as you, as you progress, then you start to figure out like, Hey, this is, this could potentially be so much better. Let's, let's improve that. Or, Hey, why aren't we thinking about this data this way? And so that's really the only difference between like career progression in my opinion. Yeah. 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 I agree with that too. Um, cool. So then I'd love to talk about just kind of like how, uh, you initially started to like look for jobs and kind of like where you thought of a, um, I guess like a slight career shift because you're now a machine learning engineer, right? Uh, and you kind of switched from that initial analytical side into ML. And so uh, how did you kind of decide to make that shift and uh, what did you do to make that change? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, the reason why I got to, into data science in the first place was to do more machine learning. And uh, that was sort of when I first switched to data science as a career path back in my undergrad program. Um, and so I didn't even know there was a role that was machine learning engineering until eight months ago, actually. Um, so once I figured out that this is actually something you can do, I was like, <laughs> wow, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and um, aside from that, like I had a degree in computer science and like emphasis in software engineering. So I had like a whole bunch of engineering opportunities and just like mindset. And I was like, yeah, that, this seems like the best of both worlds. And this seems like the kind of role that would be a perfect fit for me. Um, so I actually left my job at, at this previous company, um, back in November. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's about maybe eight months ago. Um, so what I did was I just went on like this all out, like rampage to learn as much as, uh, as much on machine learning as I could basically. And just to be the best like data science or machine learning candidate as possible. Um, so I started taking courses on Coursera. I think I took about maybe four to five classes and the reason why I say four to five is because I may I may not have finished one of them okay <laughs> that's pretty good though <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely um and yeah so I took like Andrew Ng's machine learning course I took like some deep learning courses also taught by Andrew Ng um I took like a machine learning in Python course which was like super helpful because prior to that I hadn't done any machine learning in Python basically it was mostly in R but like that's not like super industry uh, standard in say, yeah Definitely. Yeah, because I, I learned about that in, in college, but like, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely more of like an academic language. It really feels like. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then and I also took some stats courses and like just scalable machine learning courses. Um, so once I had done that, I was like, OK, I, I'm, I feel like a way more confident candidate uh, for these roles that I would like to do. So then from November to April, that was or November to March actually was my like academic journey. And then I stopped taking courses. And then towards the middle of March, up until now, basically, um, I was just full on like, okay, let's find a job. And uh, something I had mentioned to you when I first met you on interview query was like, I'm actually almost out of savings. Um, or like, I may, I may <laughs> run out of savings soon. <laughs> so that was actually like another sort of like, just fire that was lit under me. 
Oh which, yeah, like, definitely. Yeah, which made me really like focus on this like full time. I obviously like I had no excuse to just like get a job. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I mentioned March is when I started my job journey, and then around April I had started talking to some companies, and I was like, okay, I I should be fine. Like, I'm probably gonna get at least one of these companies because I think I was talking to maybe like four or five different companies. And they all, every single one of them went on hiring freezes. So then that's when like it became real. I was like, oh, there is such a thing as like, I mean, I, I knew there were hiring freezes out there. I didn't know how much of an effect it would have uh, necessarily. But like to go from zero opportunities to one to two to four to five. And then like they all like froze like in the same two weeks to go back to zero. I was like, oh my gosh, dude, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was yeah. it was like a little bit numbing, I, I would say, because um, yeah. like part of me was expecting it. Part of me was still like, is this real? Um, but yeah, I, I went I went to that, you know, just yeah, to, to back to zero opportunities. And then um, I just, yeah, picked it up from from the ground up. I was like, there's nothing else to do but apply to jobs. And so, yeah, I just went on some of the more popular job boards like Indeed, Glassdoor. I would say Indeed and Glassdoor were so much more helpful than like LinkedIn, for example. Yeah. Um, and also like, um, just cold outreach to recruiters and hiring managers, like they never responded back. So I was like, I don't really like this. And it takes a lot of time to do like individualized cold emails and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I just did the job board approach. And then, um, I think the, the response rate was something like, it's what we expect, like anywhere from two to 5%. So for every hundred that you send, you're going to get two to five responses. And like, I cherished those responses because I was like, you know, one of these has to become an offer. Like, um, so yeah, once I had, once I've had like maybe another four or five, I felt comfortable again. And I just had to make sure that I did my best on all of them. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I mean, breaking that down, it seems really uh, interesting, kind of like that journey from, uh, you know, searching like, and then realizing that, uh, you know, it's like, actually it's time to get a job, like for real this time, because <laughs> yeah. I, I need to like, I need money to survive. And, um, I think the roller coaster ride is like primarily what I've seen being the most consistent, uh, piece of like uh, takeaway that I think a lot of people get, especially in the past, um, you know, six months as like COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of, uh, you know, gone up and then gone down and gone up again as well. Uh, and I think the uncertainty just kind of like stays the same throughout. Mm -hmm. um, did you find anything uh, particularly helpful uh, besides the stuff that you already mentioned in terms of like getting the jobs? Uh, I think one thing that I've like kind of heard also on that um, specifically is that like, uh, you know, you're right. Like when you send out so many applications, I think there's like, there's basically two methods of like attack that I tell everyone. It's like, you either send like a ton of applications across, right? So you reduce your like actual um, ROI into each application so that you can move on and do like 50 more. Or mm -hmm. you like structure these like really, really solid cold emails, like LinkedIn outreaches, like make them very personalized and like show that you care. Um, and I think it's like really interesting how you mentioned that, like the uh, kind of like spray and pray approach was kind of better um do you kind of do you have any idea like kind of why that was or just was it like uh anything with your background or just any ideas yeah, yeah i mean i think uh, i was able to form like a pretty solid resume and i was able to say like on my summary that i was a data scientist with two years of experience even if that meant i wasn't a data scientist for two years it still meant like my last role technically was a data scientist and yeah. i had some experience so um yeah right off the bat that's my first uh, theory for why spray and pray was just more effective um, was because like if a recruiter uh, looks at my resume, the first thing they see is, oh, this person is not completely new into data science. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll put him in this pile. Like maybe we'll talk to him, maybe we won't. But still, I automatically didn't go to the rejection pile for a lot of companies, I think. Yep. Um, and as for like just like cold outreach. I, I'm not actually sure why it didn't work. I thought I had done like some really good emails. Um, it could be that just like in general, the response rate was pretty trash. So it wasn't my fault at all. Yeah. Um, but I didn't even like try to tinker with it too much. Once I had like a few weeks worth of data, I was like, okay, it's time to move on to something else really. Gotcha. Um, Did anyone respond and just be like, sorry, like, thanks for the email, but we're, you know, kind of like full or was it just kind of like 
emptiness, like nothing? Yeah, that's a good question. So 90% of the time it was emptiness and I, I installed like a, a Chrome extension that lets you see if someone opens your emails. Nice. So <laughs> I saw, yeah, I saw that they opened my emails and then I would send like a follow-up like a week later and I saw that they would open that one too. And like still no response. I was like, dude, that is so cold. Like, <laughs> how would you do that? Um, so it made me a little bitter, but yeah, no, to answer your question, 90% of the time it was nothing. And then the only times I did get a response were either to say, Hey, we, we, we like you, we may want to talk to you, but we're just not hiring right now. So, okay, that's fair enough. Yep. Um, and then the other time was, it was like re with recruiters, but recruiters don't really get you through the door, so to speak. Like yep. it's usually a hiring manager that can like fast track you to a technical round because the, all the recruiter can do is show you to the hiring manager. So there's still no really guarantee of anything. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that, uh, like the way that you kind of put it to, I think uh, a really good technique. Um, and you know, it, it works sometimes, but it's like, it's basically kind of like sales, right? It's like, you're creating like the CRM system. Like you're basically doing this outreach, um, almost like management where you're hitting them once, you know, if they don't respond, you want to like talk to them again, just to push up the, uh, you know, the reminder. Um, and I think that this is kind of something that kind of goes under the radar too, because uh, no one really realizes that um, these things like are actually like an effect of just general human psychology, right? It's just that you will like maybe respond. You will probably more likely to respond when you get another email. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be more likely to like get your application through if you like set your summary and like create your resume in an actual way that makes it look like you have um, good experience, which you do. Uh, and so I think that stuff like that is uh, really like underserved um and uh not really thought about too much uh as we like kind of uh i think increasingly get into this idea of like a marketplace for jobs and you're um, basically pitching yourself as like this um you know as a person that can help your company right and absolutely help at the end yeah. and to, to add on to that um so i think the cold outreach approach may actually work more if you have like good projects where you can actually link to them. Um, since I had spent the, the previous two years just working full time, I, I didn't have that like opportunity to, um, yeah, build that many interesting data science projects. So um, what I've heard is, is, is if you have a project and you can include a URL to the to the project, whether it's like a GitHub link, but more preferably like an actual URL domain, like if you yeah. if you have this hosted somewhere, especially if that's relevant to the actual to the actual company you're applying to, that's like a home run. So um, that, that's one piece of advice. And then the other thing I want to say is that, yeah, in terms of like figuring out the best formula, it's just so much different for everyone. You just have to figure out, um, for one unit of time, what yields you the most results. Yep. Um, so yeah, obviously with, with the really personalized message, like it's going to take, it might take like five times as long, but if it's just like a slightly better advantage, then you just have to play, play the probabilities really. So yeah, it's just a matter of ex experimentation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a great way to put it too. like thinking about it in terms of um, more almost like scientifically and uh, a little bit more structured. Uh, and as like general data scientists, too, I think um, I've drawn a lot of the comparisons, I think, between like the uncertainty of job interviews and uh, job searches to just like generally how um, you think of like normal distributions and uh, how like uncertain there is in just general everyday life. So. I think uh, drawing that more is like more interesting. And I think something that uh, we should all be thinking about more. Um, yeah, that's cool. actually, so one, sorry, one thing I want to add, just a funny tidbit is like, um, yeah, I totally thought about it as like a binomial distribution in terms of the probability of failing or passing uh, yeah. multiplied by the number of offers I have. And when my parents would come call me and check up on me, like I would tell them like the expected value of offers I, would, I was going to get. So I'd be like, yeah, I think I might get like 1.2 offers at the end of this month. <laughs> They're like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Um, but yeah, so just an interesting tidbit. No, I definitely thought about that too before. It's just like, okay, if I have three interviews coming up on site and I think I have at least a 50% chance of mm -hmm. getting each one, what's the probability that I walk away with at least one? Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's a pretty good way to um, at least uh, maybe plan for the future, you know? Mm -hmm.